All right, we'll call the meeting to order. I don't usually stand at a podium for our meeting, so um, just bear with me here. Uh, I'm Leslie Welts, I'm chair of the Planning Commission. And uh, the first item on it, well, second item on our agenda after calling the meeting to order is approval of the agenda. So members of the Planning Commission, is there anything that you wanna change around in the agenda? Hearing none, we'll deem it approved. Um, item three is comments to the chair. So this is the welcome. Uh, I want to just introduce uh, the members of the Planning Commission. Uh, have you all introduce yourselves? And I know it's going to take a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll get through it um, so that we know who, who's in attendance right now. And then I'll talk a little bit about what the concept is for tonight and for moving forward with the, the development of the city plan, which is this is the first of what I expect to be um, a long process, hopefully not protracted, but long enough to be uh, comprehensive. So that being said, um, I just want to introduce the members of the Planning Commission and our staff, our dedicated staff. Um, I'll start with Mike, actually. This is Mike Miller. He's the Director of Planning and Development. Is that the? Planning and Community Development. Planning and Community Development. And he he provides staff support for planning commission and other committees, some of yours as well. Um, and we'll start with Stephanie, who can introduce herself. And then after you're done, we'll hit the other two commissioners who are in the audience. And I'll ask the mayor to kick us off our introductions after that. So, Stephanie. Hi, it's Stephanie Smith. Hi, Kirby Keaton. Hi, I'm Kim Cheney. Barbara Connery. Marianne Kassam. And I'm John Adams. And our members have been on the commission since, Kim, when did you join? <laughs> that long. <laughs> 1922. <laughs> yeah. So Kim, Kim uh, has the most historic knowledge of the process and went through, the, he didn't go through the master plan process last time. So we're all new to this, I believe. No, the best. That was a couple of years before we started the zoning. Right, right. Which was a long process, as you all know. So, okay. And then I, I would just like you all to introduce yourselves and say what committee you're affiliated with. Um, and if you're not affiliated with a committee, that's fine. You're, you are welcome, of course. Just introduce yourself. So we'll start with our mayor. Sure. Hi, my name is Ann Watson. I'm mayor, and I'm so thrilled that you're all here. This is great. Donna Bates, City Council, and I'm a member of several committees. Um, what was our James back then? Uh, James Brady, Chair of the Conservation Commission. <laughs> Dan Grubber, Director of Montpelier Live. I'm Laura Gephardt, I'm the Director of the Montpelier Development Corporation. I'm uh, Stevens, and I'm on the board of the Montpelier Housing Authority. I'm Joanne Tryon, Director of the Montpelier Housing Authority. Hi, I'm Jen Holler, and I'm the other co-chair of the Montpelier Housing Task Force. Hi, I'm Kate McCarthy, and I'm the vice chair of the city's development review board. Sarah Hoffmeyer, and I'm on the Montpelier Tree Board. I'm Kate Stevenson, chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Glenn Hutchinson, City Council District 3. Well, Sir Willow with the uh, Recreation Department's Advisory Board. I'm the Lawman, Executive Director of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Doug Hoyt, member of the uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Elizabeth Parker, Interloper, Sustainable Market Coalition. <laughs> Dan Jones, uh, Executive Director of Montpelier, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Dan Costin, I'm on the Energy Committee and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Lynn Moyle with the Montpelier Tree Board. I'm also a Dan, Dan Dickerson of the Montpelier Parks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tino O'Brien, the Chair of the Board of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Mary Hooper, a member of the Housing Task Force and Stick Rep. Former Mayor. <laughs> 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry. Okay, Eric that's... Gilbertson, I'm chair of the Star Trek Racing Commission and vice chair of the Design Review Committee. And yeah, I'm Laura Byron. I'm here with Sustainable Monthly or Coalition. I'm Jenny Cook. I'm an interested citizen. Great. <laughs> Great. Okay, we get everyone? Okay. I was trying to check off to see who was here at the same time, so um, I don't know how good I was at that, but we'll see. So um, you all read my letter. I'll just sort of reiterate. We're here to just kick off the conceptual topics of what we want to cover in our city plan. Uh, I thought, you know, we got the suggestion from the energy committee, I think it was, about it would really be helpful to hear what other committees are thinking about so that we don't uh, inadvertently have conflicting goals or duplicative processes, and so we birthed this process. So we're all kind of just seeing how it goes, and I think that we're really just here to talk very broadly, generally, what are the goals that your committees care about and are focused on, and we're going to go from there. I think that the next step after this meeting is going to be for us to get a repository online, a website, <laughs> as it's known, to, <laughs> right, to collect information in a, a constructive and consistent manner from the committees. And that way we can you know, start with this broad level and start collecting more details about that. And then we can decide whether another committee meeting after all committee meeting after that would be fruitful and productive. Uh, we don't want to waste your time because you're already volunteering, <laughs> going above and beyond, and we appreciate that. I mean, we are all, we're all here as volunteers, so we just figure out the best way to be productive and, and consistent and not have conflicting goals. Um, I think Mike Miller is going to get into more details about our idea of what the, ma the city plan, we're calling it city plan, not master plan, because we think it's a little bit more of an, it's, it's a little bit more of a nuanced, um, accurate descriptor of what this is. Rather, a master plan, you kind of think of construction or development, and although we are doing that in a way, this is, city plan is, I mean, municipal plan is a, a statutory term that we're doing, so let's, let's use the term. So that, that's where we were thinking, we're calling it city plan rather than master plan, as was previously the practice. Um, so he's going to talk a little bit more about what our overarching goal is for when we get further down the development of our city plan so that you can have in mind where we're thinking of going. Tonight is not, we're not there yet. I don't want anyone to feel like they don't have enough information. It's really just about us all learning about each other's goals. So that, that's it for tonight. Um, I am going to call up the presenters in order. We're going to have Mike give a few comments before we move into your presentations. But once we start, I'll call up the presenter, announce who's on deck, so that you'll, you'll be able to position yourself, get some water, whatever you need to do. Um, you'll have five minutes. And Arian will hold up a little sign. Can you show us your sign? <laughs> For one minute left. <laughs> We're going to try to stick to five minutes, because we don't want to keep you here all night. And we only have the space for limited time. So she's going to hold it up for one minute. And when you're out of time, and if, if you are really going over at that point, I'm going to have to cut you off. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. So, um, and if you really didn't get through everything, then if we have time at the end, we'll come back and get to you again. Um, Donna has a question. I was just wondering how many committees you invited and how many responded? I think we invited 17 or 18. And we have 13 or 14 presentations so tonight. Well, we have to. We haven't gone through all of that list, yeah, I haven't but all those um, but we'll certainly be following up with them and going from. You know, we'll see where we go from there. Um, but we w we wanted to have a little bit more lead time before this meeting in hopes of having everyone in attendance, but we did the best we could and we're really impressed with the amount of turnout we got within a month of notice so thank you all for making that happen and not everybody who's here received an invitation um, and you should have so <laughs> I appreciate 
everyone who reached out to me identifying themselves as a committee that should be involved in the process because we do want you involved. So it was not, it was inadvertent, believe me. Any other questions about process for this evening before we get started? Great. Well, you can interrupt at any time. Um, so that's those are my comments, and I think that's it for item three. And with that being said, we're gonna we're gonna kick it off with our director of planning, Mike Miller. Oh, one thing I should note: the the Orca Media microphone is on the podium here, so you can move from the podium, but don't stray too far. Um, and if you do, you're going to get a signal from John Jose back there, I think, about it. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Mike Miller, planning director. I know almost everybody here, but a couple of new faces. Um, so I'll jump right in. I'll keep this short, because I know we've had a lot of people who are presenting. So the community. Uh, the Planning Commission goals, we really kind of had three goals uh, that we came up with when we started talking about redoing the plan. The first thing, when we looked at the old plans, we wanted to reorganize based on um, topics which have corresponding committees. Um, so if you look at the current plan, it isn't organized this way and it makes it more difficult to uh, implement. So we want to have a housing chapter, energy chapter, transportation chapter, historic preservation chapter, natural resources, community services. So each chapter will have a plan that goes along with it. And because Montpelier has a lot of committees, we actually have at least one committee for every uh, chapter that we're writing. Um, so the second one was that we want the new plan to be more strategic uh, in implementing. The, some of the issues that we had with the previous plan is it was very well written from a goals plan and vision, but it didn't really help us define how we were going to get there. So we really wanted to strengthen and be more strategic. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to make this more of a 21st century plan, um, make it web-based with more links to information, try to keep the chapters short um, so people can really learn stuff but not get overwhelmed with 500 pages. Um, so today, um, as Leslie kind of introduced, uh, we'll learn about the upcoming city plan process, the initial thoughts from committees on their goals and aspirations, and uh, we'll talk about the next steps, um, which we already have a little bit, um, and we'll get into that. So what do we mean by aspirations when we're talking about that? These are really our long-term visions. We want them to be clear and positive. We want to you know, uh, we want clean water. We don't want to not have pollution. So we try to be positive in our, um, what we want to see in the future. And if you can't articulate that vision, tell us what you want to see in 10 years or 20 years. We can always help work out what the vision will be. The key is just to get some time to, to start to think about what we want to see going forward. And, and this will come up more, this, uh, mock-up that we did for a city filled with butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns. And it wasn't meant to trivialize this, and it wasn't meant to um, uh, kind of marginalize anything. It just uh, it helped us to be able to formulate how would you go through and write a goal, and how would you write an aspiration, and how would you write the strategies without having to worry about the details, um, because it's just made up, but it did help us to chart a nice clear path for how we would get from aspirations to, to the vision accomplished. Um, and that structure really helps out and it'll come back when we get to the next steps this fall. So framing goals, uh, what we did, this kind of goes back to the, the maintain evolve, or goes back to, the, to our work that we did with the uh, unicorns, rainbows, idea was breaking the vision for the goals, break the visions into small bite-sized pieces. Um, and what we wanted goals to work into is maintain, evolve, and transform. So maintain is, um, is your vision to work to keep something the same, maintaining the historic integrity of our National Register District. So sometimes our goals are to keep something the same. Sometimes they are to evolve. Um, what needs to change in an incremental way, increase rental housing development until 5% vacancy is achieved. Um, and finally, there are transformative ideas. What, what won't happen without big changes? 
So net zero 2030 is transformative. It, you know, it will require how we, to change how we live our lives. Um, we could talk about the, the railroad transit oriented design. That's another big one that would require a kind of a transformative idea. So the next steps after we get through these, um, which I think Leslie kind of went over really quickly, which was the planning, commis planning commission will review what's presented tonight. We'll work through and refine these goals and aspirations. And then, you know, I think we'll need to have a public hearing to review the goals with presentation to the council. I think the important part of this first step is because it's difficult to implement if we don't, if we haven't all agreed on the goals, it's really hard. Um, and I actually think that the planning step, this first step, is actually the harder piece. Um, a lot of times plans fall back on vague words because it's easier. And what we're going to try to do is to kind of get away from the vagueness and really get to the, to the important pieces of all of these goals because it'll make it a lot easier if we know exactly what we want to do to start coming up with strategies to say how we're going to get there. So, and then the third step will, uh, you know, the second step is we would go through another round of these, how to write implementation strategies with committees. And we have uh, the five Ps, which uh, sounds all mysterious, but it's just really about different strategies, um, whether it's policies or permits or programs for how we would implement things. Um, and then we would have another round of these all committee meetings in the fall where we can start to talk about how our implementation strategies relate before having a round of public hearings and council review and then we pull it all together into a plan. So this will take a good deal of time. Um, you know, I'm hoping if we're done by the end of 2019, I would consider it a big success. It takes time to, to meet with all the committees and pull everything together. So, um, but thank you all for, um, for coming tonight and for giving us your input. And I kind of rushed through a bunch of things so we can try to save some time. But if you have any questions. Thanks, Mike. So first, we have Kate from the Energy Advisory Committee. Um, we're going to go till 7 or 10 past 7, and then we'll take a just quick break. I'm just going to read out the order so that you have an idea of where you are. Um, so we have the Energy Advisory Committee, Conservation Committee, Montpelier Development Corporation, Montpelier Housing Authority, Transportation Infrastructure Committee, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, Housing Task Force, Parks Commission, Recreation Department Advisory Board, Tree Board, Development Review Board, Historic Preservation Commission, and then we were, uh, we received materials from Complete Streets Group, but we don't have a representative tonight, but we'll put their goals up on the screen. So that's, so. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, as we work through, we have some slides, but we don't have slides from everybody. So Barb has graciously uh, volunteered to sketch up some notes of the goals that are articulated by our speakers tonight. So if you could make sure that I'm getting these goals correctly as you're going through your process, that would be great. This is a test, Barbara, because you wrote ours, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara's on our committee also. So. Um, well, great. Hi, everybody. Welcome from the Energy Advisory Committee. And we've got quite a few of our members in the audience tonight. Um, I think our aspiration is pretty clear, um, but also pretty audacious, um, that Montpelier will become the first capital city to use 100% renewable energy and eliminate fossil fuel use. Um, and so, in breaking that down into some more tangible goals, we really kind of divided it into two transformational goals. One is by 2030, 100% of municipal energy used for thermal, electric, and transportation will be renewable or offset. And then by the second goal is by 2050, community-wide fossil fuel use will be eliminated and 100% of all energy needs will be met renewably. So there you have it. Um, <laughs> no problem. Um, so we have gone into a lot of detail about the, the baseline conditions, the different timelines for different pieces of this. But I just wanted to give you kind of overall bullet points of some of the strategies that we're considering. And I think we're still working on a lot of our strategies. 
Um, the first is really conservation, reducing electric and heating fuel use by 30%. Um, then one policy strategy is to require new construction to be built to net zero standards. Love to talk to the housing committee about that. Um, reduce automo automobile vehicle miles traveled. Weatherize approximately 200 homes a year. Explore potential for cogeneration through district heat and the wastewater recovery facility. Um, evaluate all existing buildings for rooftop solar potential. Implement fuel switching to uh, renewable fuels, wood and heat pumps, district heat and ground source heat pumps. Um, introduce microtransit and public transit as one of the strategies to reduce vehicle miles traveled and switch to electric vehicles and biodiesel vehicles. That's all, yeah. Okay, Conservation Committee with Montpelier Development Corporation on deck. Did we get everything far before we start? Did we get everything that you needed? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Kate's always a tough act to follow, so great job. Thanks. <laughs> um, we have the same exact goals and aspirations. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we're in a, we were in a good spot to, to look into this at our last meeting. We finished up our strategic plan matrix about a year and a half ago, which gave us a kind of a a list of everything in, under the sun that we want to prioritize as a conservation commission. Um, and I actually worked with Mike Miller back about a year and a half ago and I, we drafted up some, some of the language and it's actually switched a little bit since then as we start digging into these goals. So um, we're really excited that the process is happening now. I think we've um, got some good momentum going to, to add some good stuff to this, this plan. So um, based on our commission, our goals that came from that strategic planning, our geographic size, our location in the state, in the region. Um, we, are, we had our top priority land at stormwater management and planning, and that's been something that we've been working towards and kind of trying to knock off some low-hanging fruit um, for stormwater infrastructure uh, projects. And we kind of, our aspiration is to, you know, have no polluted water go into our watershed. Um, um, Next, we've been working really hard to map and inventory all natural resources that uh, are of high priority within the city limits. And we've had some really successful um, studies go on where we've had our vernal pools mapped, which we just recently were able to use to help with um, the mountain biking trail that's going on near the, the North Branch Nature Center. So they were able to avoid uh, a wetland area and buffer there, which is really exciting. Uh, so we want to continue to um, increase that inventory, and our aspiration would be to map every single bug, animal, and plant in the city, and hopefully keep them native and bring in the natives. So um, that's our second um, big goal. And our third big goal is to, once we clean up all the water and map everything, we want to teach everybody where all the resources are and why they're important. So outreach and public education is, a, is, a, is our third big goal, and we're really excited about implementing that strategy through either farmer's market or a better um, social network um, outreach program. So uh, yeah, so that's, those are our three main goals um, moving forward. I think I'll just look over here. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Pub yeah. Public outreach and education. Yep. Great. So I think that's. If there's any questions before me. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, Montpelier Development Corporation with Montpelier Housing Authority on deck. Hello. Uh, so we're doing sort of a joint. Uh, presentation uh, because our two organizations are very uh, complementary and collaborate on quite a bit. Uh, so my name is Laura Gebhardt and I'm the executive director of the Montpelier Development Corporation. 
Um, and the Development Corporation um, exists to ensure the economic vitality and sustainability of the city of Montpelier. Um, and we can get into how we do that and what we're doing. Um, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> I'm Dan Groberg. I'm the Executive Director of Montpelier Live, and our mission is to celebrate downtown Montpelier. Um, our aspiration is that Montpelier serves as the economic, social, and cultural center for central Vermont with a thriving downtown and unique sense of place where existing businesses of all size feel valued and engaged and startups are encouraged and supported. So our first goal uh, falls under Evolve. Uh, Montpelier has a wraparound system of support for existing and new businesses. Um, and just to provide some context of what that means, that includes housing for our workforce, uh, workforce development, business advisory services, um, strengthening the relationship between the city residents, city council, commissions, and businesses. Um, so that's really, it's an, a very comprehensive um, idea we have about that wraparound service. Our second goal, which we wrote down as transform, but I don't think that gives enough credit to what we have already, so I'm changing it to evolve. Uh, Montpelier, <laughs> Montpelier is recognized as a destination for arts and culture, um, and some of what we were thinking includes public art, downtown events, a streetscape, uh, and downtown beautification. And our third goal is transform, um, and that's Montpelier is transformed by new development that maximizes existing assets which include our rivers and historic character um, and really embodies the, our community values. Um, and so again, just to provide some context to that, that's to activate our rivers, actually utilize those um, in our development plans, uh, utilize land to meet housing and commercial needs. Um, so we can get to vacancy rates that are above uh, 1%, um, have inclusive development, sustainable development, um, and really engage the community in those processes. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. Can you give us an example of utilizing the river better? Yeah, so uh, even just having river access, um, we have these beautiful assets and you only really get a great view when you're in the middle of a bridge. So can we have amenities that are along the river that can tap into economic development that's driven by you know, our natural assets? Um, you can spur you know, recreational tourism and a lot of really impactful things by utilizing a natural asset. Yeah. You doing any thinking about uh, development in floods? Yeah, so that's part of how do we, you know, we can't develop in areas that have flooding and we have, you know, the 100 year floodplain and floodways that we have to think about, so. Which is now 20 years. Yeah, so we have to be conscious of that and that impacts any development that occurs. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a little outline of what, what it is that you're thinking about as a goal for that? For, in terms of flood areas, or? Yeah. I mean, we have downtown, and it's hard to develop if it's going to be flooded. I just wonder if, I mean, it's early in this planning, but have you got any general directions you want to go in that? think any ways to mitigate it and that's where I'd look to the planning commission or the planning department to help advise and really other commissions that have some specialization in these areas and we have a you know great architects throughout the city who can help mitigate some of those issues. So we have the rules that require a certain elevation for development to I mean is it, how many, something about three two feet two, two feet, feet above the yeah, yeah so we have that and then but it would allow for parking underneath because you can move the cars and remove the cars and then the property isn't damaged. So there's, there's yeah. lots of things like that using the rivers, the river hazard area rules that we have. Yeah. I think there's also opportunities in the work that the Conservation Commission is doing, for example, to do stormwater management and um, flood mitigation management that can enable development. Yeah, and our idea with, you know, utilizing the river, it doesn't mean putting a, planting a building right on top of it. It means how can we utilize that asset to the to the best of its ability. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, I do. <laughs> I, just because I don't understand economic and social development that well, to be honest. I, so I mean, how the first goal that you outlined, me, I, I wrote down epicenter, <laughs> maybe that wasn't the word you used, but um, 
an economic center, is what you wrote? I mean, what, what's mm -hmm. the vision, like what's the region you're thinking of? The economic center, that's our aspiration. And we said an economic, social, and cultural center for central yeah. Vermont, is what we said. Oh, okay. um, but our first goal was a wraparound system of support for new and existing businesses. Okay. Have you, so, so piggybacking that a little bit, what have you identified as, as some of the most important milestones to get us towards that aspiration? Is it, um, <laughs> not to put it on you guys, like, yeah, so feel free to punt. Um, it, it's your problem. Um, but but, it, but just, just as a brainstorming thing, because that's what we're here for, like, what are, what are some of the things to get us there, uh, such as we need a convention center or we need whatever? Well, <laughs> hi, I'm so many ideas here. So um, a big thing um, that you know we like to f we focus on and a lot of areas are moving towards is you know really lifting up your existing industries. Um, we have some really strong employers in our area. They need to grow. They want to grow. Do we have the amenities to help them grow? So simple as that. You know we have National Life, Vermont Mutual. You know some big heavy hitters. Do we have the ability to assist in their expansions? Do we have the space to accommodate that, let alone the housing to accommodate their workforce? So can we you know, make our strong employers stronger? Um, and that's, there's small things that we can put in place to help that. It's not necessarily you know, a convention center and that helps us get there. It's where we play off a lot of these committees of we need more housing to accommodate the workforce. We need to think about development in a different way to best utilize the space we have available because we have employers busting at the seams and we don't want to lose them because those are, you know, well-paying jobs. Those are people are, shot, are eating downtown during the day if they're not living here. So there's a lot of things that we just want to build on um, that are already existing here, but how do we make those pieces stronger? Does that kind of get to your question? Yeah, I question? think that's wonderful. I think, okay. I think that is a way to link this up with so many other things. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing housing and then, and then other like secondary business services. Business services and something that continues to come up um, in conversations we have is just resources for existing businesses, especially small businesses and startups. Um, there's a bit of a gap in resources that are available, um, not just in Montpelier, but in Vermont in general. Um, so can, if we can bridge that gap, provide mentoring programs, um, any sort of programs that provides resources that get to small businesses' needs. So some of that as well. Do you have anything to add? Startup, startup incubator is a more specific, if you're looking for a more specific idea. Like a physical space is an incubator. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that would include training and mentorship mm -hmm. services. Hi everyone, um, my name is Katie and I'm here tonight representing the Montpelier Housing Authority. And hang on, just um, a second, yep. let's let oh, describe. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Don't want to punish him more than we already have. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so especially since I didn't get uh, slides together tonight. So career teaching. Housing authority. Housing authority. Yes, Housing Authority. So the Montpelier Housing Authority promotes and provides affordable housing in Montpelier. Um, the target populations are, for housing assistance are the elderly, uh, persons with disabilities, and family with children, um, although income uh, limits apply to all of the programs. Single persons who qualify for Section 8 um, vouchers can um, also apply for assistance, but all families, elderly, and disabled persons must be housed first. Um, we have a few, so we're technically not a city agency. Um, we are a city appointed board that um, oversees the work of the MHA, which is an independent local agency. Um, we, uh, they, their budget is, or our budget, <laughs> is uh, funded by uh, federal subsidies and fees direct, paid directly to the MHA um, for managing other subsidized um, buildings in the area, subsidized housing buildings. Um, so the MHA does not receive state or local funds, but we do pay for services used and property taxes. So we have a few goals for the next um, 10 years or so. 
Uh, and most of it is about keeping the status quo, to be honest, because we feel that the MHA has been doing a very good job of meeting its um, mission. So the first is to um, continue to promote cooperation and communication um, with members of the community, with city officials, um, with and with relevant agencies such as the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and um, the USDA Rural Development Department. Um, so for this one uh, in particular, you know, we're, the MHA has, has an easily accessible office in Pioneer Apartments um, down on Main Street, um, and the board's meetings are always publicly available. Um, the executive director, Joanne Troiano, uh, is a member of the Housing Task Force, so she's always in communication um, about the housing goals. And she also sends annual reports to the mayor, um, and uh, we just aim to continue that. Um, the second goal is to promote the maintenance of Montpelier rental housing um, and to determine what need will be, there will be in the future. Um, we um, facilitate, the MHA facilitates the use of Section 8 housing in small and large buildings in Montpelier. Um, they work with landlords to meet the HUD standards to have a Section 8 um, voucher applied to the use. Um, there's also a program for homeowners to use Section 8 uh, vouchers towards their own mortgages so that they can kind of keep it local. Um, our third goal is to um, mobilize resources to improve existing housing uh, of the MHA-owned buildings in particular. Um, the MHA owns two buildings in town, and then there are another um, three which are owned by the Capital City Housing Foundation, which is the 501C three um, arm of the Montpelier Housing Authority. Um, and we have a strong record of keeping these buildings maintained, but we sometimes need to take in a, a particular, a, a new path. And there's one building that we are managing, or that we own, that um, needs a little bit direction. So we've kind of asked for a needs assessment on how to move forward with that. So that's our, our three goals. They not, might not be the most useful to the Planning Commission. They're more focused on what we need, but that's where we are. Mobilize resources for existing housing authority buildings. Yeah. So what, I have a question. Uh, why, why don't you think they'll be useful for the planning commission? I mean, um, we care about this too. <laughs> well, true. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't know. I just, because we're yeah. a little bit more self-directed than, but we, it might be helpful to know that those yeah, are, no, that's I, what I, we're doing. Don't okay. under account your, you know, discount your, your goals here. This is why we're, you know, we want to hear it. I think that this does play into other things that are, like the maintenance of rental properties, I'm seeing a crossover with energy over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. there's, there's a lot of this one. Thank you. Oh, Barbara's question. Yeah, is there an opportunity to expand the properties that you have? Um, yes and no. Right now, there we, the Housing Authority has um, 122 vouchers um, kind of allotted to it, but we can only, we typically have about 110 in use at any given time because there are too few properties in Montpelier and the sur like, sur uh, surrounding Mostly area. Mostly due to lack of federal funding. The mm -hmm. funding have been cut back. But, um, right now we're having a problem because a lot of our um, voucher holders find housing with downstreet and because of renovating three buildings, mm -hmm. they emptied the buildings and put them in other apartments so they have very little in the way of vacancies. And the vacancy rate in Montpelier, in general, is very small. I mean, we need apartments. Rentals evolve uh, rental sizes. Not sizes, but I think in my brain is Prices. 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 Prices, thank yeah. you. <laughs> a range. So if, uh, we, we anticipate that a lot of people will talk about housing, and we plan to, to be active in housing. If we're successful in increasing the housing stock, how will that interplay with what MHA is doing? Would that be an opportunity to increase subsidized housing, or do you think the levels would stay the same? Or? Uh, I mean, I, I think that there are always opportunities um, for housing. There's different needs at different times, so, and we're always open to hearing what the community feels that they need. Um, for additional housing, what types, 
whether it's transitional housing. I know years ago there was a, well not maybe not that many years ago there was a, it's not fair. Barry has a shelter. Montpelier isn't doing anything, and so when the opportunity came, the grant came to uh, Good Samaritan. They did the um, temporary shelter at Bethany, and the housing authority contributed funds because they required a walk-in shower. And so you know, even in small little ways, trying to <coughs> um, cooperate with other agencies. And um, you know, right now, between French Block and then Taylor Street, there's some new housing. There's been, uh, Steve Bertolini just did six units down off Berry Street that are, I think, opening now. So I think we do need to increase the stock Mm -hmm. There's talk of whether to do housing inspections and registrations, and that's we've been talking about that. This would be the probably the third iteration that I've been involved with of uh, inspection programs. And Mount Pili does a pretty big job of keeping up the stock. I don't think you, know, you have the huge problem of derelict buildings or vacant buildings. There's almost no vacant. Infrastructure Committee. I was expecting Jen Gordon to be here. Actually, yeah, I didn't hear it. That's the one check I didn't have on here. I don't know if you want to say I'm happy anything. to talk for a minute, and you know, maybe Donna can help as well because she was at our last meeting. Okay. If you prefer, I can move you. Um, I, I think it's fine. We might just have to edit okay. later when Jen, if Jen gets here. Okay. But, um, uh, so I'm Dan Costin. I'm on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. And just for background, uh, there's some um, funds that come from the parking meters. It's an alternative transportation fund. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe $40,000 a year or so. And uh, we have authority to spend that money on improvements to infrastructure within the city. And uh, some of the goals that we talked about uh, in our last meeting uh, were to implement some of the plans that are existing that we have for transportation uh, in the city, in particular the Montpelier in Motion Plan. Uh, it's a very detailed plan. It probably has 75 goals in it. So trying to break it down to three was quite uh, difficult. And we had some time in our meeting trying to narrow it down. Uh, but from what I remember uh, in our meeting, we really wanted to um, uh, work on some of uh, the new plans that we're developing that are more detailed than the Montpelier in Motion plan. And one of them is our complete streets plan, which is uh, you know, in process, and also a, um, uh, a uh, traffic calming policy which is not necessarily infrastructure directly, but it's a process where we can get community input. Uh, and if there's a problem in the community, like, uh, for example, the four-way stop uh, at Elm and Spring Streets, which was recently implemented, something like that can be done to help you know, reduce uh, issues of uh, cars traveling too fast and pedestrians not having a chance to walk the streets. Uh, another aspect that we mentioned uh, in our meeting uh, was we really wanted to create uh, a safe and inviting uh, city for pedestrians and uh, bikers. And so it goes beyond, you know, just, you know, putting paint on the roads to try to say, you know, the cars and the bicycles should share traffic. But we really need to put uh, infrastructure on the ground that makes the routes that people uh, uh, use for transport safer uh, and create the uh, network of uh, easy paths for people to walk and bike through the city, north-south routes and east-west routes, uh, to get to the center of the city to do the things they want to do, to have uh, bicycle parking in the city uh, so they have uh, convenience when they're using their bicycle, uh, and uh, closing the gaps that exist that are you know, barriers uh, to that transportation. So that's only two goals, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what the third was, but uh, I think we did talk about uh, transit as well. Transit's very important to the committee, although it's not the most major focus. 
Our major focus is uh, for uh, bikes and pedestrians uh, to get to those transportation resources, such as the new uh, transit center that's going in. You don't have to have three goals. <laughs> <laughs> More goals than we can handle. Okay, do you have something else you can add, Donna? The short end of it. We started out with a vision, and so when uh, Dan mentioned the studies, the one that comes to mind is the Green of America, but also we had the Main Street scoping study, looking at all the intersections on Main Street, and then we've also had the study of the complete streets, and that's looking at how we reduce the amount of pavement, it increase the amount of greenery, uh, stormwater treatment, rain mm -hmm. gardens, and that we start proportioning all of our streetscapes more to the human dimension instead of the auto dimension. Mm -hmm. And it's a real beautiful picture of which Jen will be sending you <laughs> from these studies uh, that really that's what we're working towards. So any way of increasing pedestrians, increasing cyclists, wherever they're going, whether it's on the street or in the trails or in the path, that's what our real goal is, and our strategy is behind that. But it's a real pretty community when we get done with it. So I want Excellent. you to have that vision. Great, thank you. Okay, so how are we with the goals on the board? Anything more on transit? Oh, to accommodate, encourage. Yeah, and, and encourage. Accommodate and encourage. Oh, hi, question. I do have a question for you, Dan. Thank you. Um, in looking at your goal for safe and inviting city pedestrians and bikers, are, is there also conversation in your committee about educating cyclists on how to uh, follow the vehicular laws so that it's safe? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there's actually two, there's two bicycle uh, committees. There's another committee that has exactly that goal. We're mainly the infrastructure, and there's another committee that's really dedicated towards education and policy. I suspected that might be true, but I was just curious. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Okay, all right. I, I just oh. want to say that as, as a pedestrian, an occasional biker, my question would be more to how do we educate drivers <laughs> to respect cyclists and pedestrians. Because that, both ways. That's just one of yeah. my third point of view. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, and if I may, I think something you said earlier, Dan, about transportation infrastructure and what it can accomplish, can answer both those questions. So yeah. the streets are designed in a way that makes it really clear who's supposed to be doing what where and how fast. That can help um, solve a lot of those problems at, at the interface of the kind of travel uh, in an ideal world. <laughs> yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and then Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Okay. I think they're visual for both of these. Change the pace. And then after the Sustainable Development Montpelier Coalition, we'll take a five minute break. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am the executive director of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, uh, which was legislatively chartered in uh, 2014 as a union municipal district after a vote of uh, joining the membership of the city of Montpelier and by the city of Barrie. Since that time, we've also grown by adding the capital fire and mutual aid uh, district as a as a third member. I'd like to take a moment and introduce uh, Donna Bate, uh, who everybody knows. She's one of our board members, Doug Hoyt here, and uh, Kim Cheney on the Planning Commission. Uh, our, our, our purpose has been to work towards trying to consolidate, integrate, and regionalize public safety services to make these services uh, more efficient. Just imagine, oh, and we have, we have tr oh, focused the last three years on trying to uh, do this by starting with dispatching as a, as, a, as a singular function to consolidate. But uh, imagine, if you will, that you are uh, in, or there's a traffic accident. You're in a traffic accident at Berlin Four Corners, the intersection of uh, North Payne Turnpike and Route 62. It's a fairly serious uh, bodily injury traffic accident. So of course, uh, the phone, you pick the cell phone up and you call 911 and a uh, very efficient system, the 911 call taker answers the phone 
and is uh, not only dealing with you, giving uh, emergency medical instructions if needed, but also in the process of transferring that dispatching call to and your, the emergency service providers that need to respond to that accident. Well, emergency service providers that need to respond to the accident is kind of the key to this little uh, story because Berlin receives uh, ambulance service with a contract through the town of Barry. So Barry receives its dispatching services from Lamoille County. So that 911 call taker to get the ambulance to you, to you at, uh, in Berlin has to call Lamoille Sheriff's Department to dispatch the ambulance. Meanwhile, Berlin Fire Department has a fast squad. They have to respond as well. And oh, by the way, they are dispatched by the Montpelier Police Department because they're part of the Capitol Fire uh, system. So uh, that call handler is responding by sending um, uh, Berlin Fire to the accident through, uh, through Lamoille. And the police department has to go there because they have to investigate the accident. And oh, by the way, they're dispatched by the state police, so the state police gets that call. Very inefficient system. Now, you're probably saying, but that's in the town of Berlin. We have a very good dispatching service in Montpelier. Yes, absolutely, you're correct. What we're asking for is to think beyond the traditional paradigm that exists. We're trying to break down political boundaries, if you will, uh, because we live in a highly mobile, highly technologically advanced uh, society right now. And as I started, that accident could be involving you, the Montpelier citizen. We believe that standardized services need to be a choice for everybody across central Vermont. And so we are working hard at trying to develop a unified delivery system of public safety services. We're trying to get our members to play leadership roles in trying to promote a better uh, mousetrap, if you will, for public safety services. We are trying to influence the legislature to take a look at this from a systemic perspective, this being dispatching and delivery of public safety services. And so our primary goal for uh, uh, our mission, if you will, is to develop a unification or unified public safety services throughout central Vermont. We want to do that uh, by expanding and developing the services, uh, focusing on employee-focused uh, employment and customer service. We would like to uh, regionalize or, or consolidate management and administrative services and leave the delivery of services as they exist now within the in individual communities. Thus, we'd like to achieve the uh, benefits of economies of scale while still focusing on local control and local service delivery. Did I make my five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Unless there's any questions, thank you. Hi there. We're the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, and I guess we fall in the category of sort of transformational big think uh, for this. Uh, our mission is to help catalyze uh, our community to reimagine the land use downtown uh, and then foster the community engagement necessary to transform that support into a sustainable future. Our three main goals for the downtown of Montpelier are one, to create green spaces with access to the river. Two, to see over a thousand new housing units in and near the downtown by 2030. And three, to transform how we get around so that our downtown will be freed from the demands of the single occupancy auto. Now those goals arose from the Sustainable Montpelier 2030 design competition that completed a year and a half ago. This picture here is the winning design which uh, won the majority of the votes in uh, the 700 cast in the final round of the competition. It's the template which we're using for these suggestions. And we look forward to working with you, the commission, uh, so that these ideas can be incorporated into the new city plan. 
It's our hope that the city will adopt this vision for diversifying its land use so that Montpelier can become the durable, vital, and beautiful community and one that benefits all of its citizens. Now many of you have seen this visual. It shows the current state of our land use downtown. So over 65% of uh, that land is dedicated to parking lots. Yet if you ask the average Montpelier right, what's the biggest problem downtown? It's lack of parking. National studies have consistently shown that paved over parking lots are the source of economic loss for our downtown and detract from the quality of life. They take up space that could have higher and better uses. One of our board members kind of put it this way. We knew need to move towards a more, more uses of the same space for more people more of the time. Now many of our citizens buy into that need of rethinking our land use along the river, which gets us into the first of the goals, which is open space, reclaiming our river. As you saw, that winning design had a really good idea of how to recapture the green space along the river. We know from other cities around the country that who practice smart growth, but the, it's best to plan for the open spaces first and then site new business and housing. In this way, the beauty and benefit of the landscape can be featured in those plans. This is a vision that came with the uh, design competition of a riverfront park at the confluence of the North Branch. Now we can and should access our rivers so we can picnic and stroll along the river and even maybe find a place to put in a kayak. These are all activities that would boost our economy, our livability, and our quality of life. The next area is in new housing and commercial space. Do we go back one, or do we go? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, once the green space is determined, energy efficient, zero carbon housing uh, and commercial space can be built. And from them, new neighborhoods can emerge. Building on the work of the Bridges team and other designers, we'd like to create a framework for the redevelopment of land to increase housing density and and then to support a walkable downtown. This plan, and you can see all, how it fills in all, all along the river here and even back up in Court Street, et cetera, okay, provides a thousand new units in and around the downtown. We hope to partner with the city in finding new ways of supporting a variety of housing developments and with the idea that mixed use is crucial. Next we get to transportation. We cannot manage any of these good ideas in the future of our city unless we can find ways of getting folks in and out of town to work, shop, and recreate without their cars. Otherwise, the default transportation uh, priority is to use our land space for parking. This Im image of a downtown uh, station suggests that real multimodal transportation means it's trains, it's bus, it's parked cars and walking. It's bikes. We have already started working with the city to reduce the number of vehicles in the downtown by building a plan for concentrating the parking in remote lots. We will next be looking at how to create microtransit options. We urge the commission to make sure that concrete forward thinking transportation transition is at core of the next city plan, not as a periphery. Montpelier has been doing city plans for years. Okay, we've been, uh, and we've got had many good ideas, and they're all on the shelf at the planning department. So our question must be, must be how to turn those plans into living, breathing facts on the ground. Just like you tonight, bring together the various committees here to ensure the next city plan reflects the energy and imagination of our public volunteers. We're planning on bringing together the community stakeholders into roundtables on the three priority areas, transportation, open space, and housing and through them coalesce solutions and an action plan. If the city plan can hopefully reflect these visions, we hope that we can work together with you for a long time. Thank you very much. You. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, Leslie. Hi, I'm uh, Jen Holler, and with me is Holly Nickel, and we're the co-chairs of the Montpelier Housing Task Force. 
Um, and we uh, would like to start by thanking the Planning Commission for bringing us all together. It's a great way to hear um, what the, the many, many commonalities between all of our aspirations, and that's pretty exciting. It's also really inspiring for me to see all the people who love our little city um, enough to um, donate their volunteer time, and um, I think there's a lot we're going to be able to do together. Um, the role of the Housing Task Force is to make recommendations to the City Council, and we're a volunteer group, um, uh, to make recommendations around policies, programs, and uh, projects um, that increase the availability and the affordability of housing. Um, and this includes particularly the uses of the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund, um, and which supports the creation of new housing, and the French Block is the most recent example of that. So there's a um, the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund in the city dedicated funding to that, um, to that project. It was um, a very small part of that overall million, many millions that went into that project, but by um, making um, funds available that the city commits, it helps attract all the other resources, so it's an important uh, piece. Another thing that the Housing Trust Fund has supported lately is a down payment assistance program, which helps um, folks with just moderate incomes who might not otherwise be able to buy into Montpelier, um, afford their first home, and be part of our community. So over the last few months, we've been um, developing a set of aspirations, and we plan to add goals um, and actions to them um, with the hope of informing the city's housing strategy and also to sort of guide our work um, as, a, as a task force. And, and um, here they are. So this is really at the butterfly and unicorn level. Um, pretty, very much aspirational, um, but they're essentially, the first bullet is essentially just ma making sure there's enough housing and people can afford it. Um, and we want all types of housing. Vermont, Montpelier does actually a pretty good job of having a variety of um, uh, bedroom sizes, um, a good mix of rental and owner-occupied and condominium options. Um, there are, um, and they fall in a variety of types of neighborhoods. Um, and what do we want that housing to be like? That's the second bullet. Um, primarily, it needs to be safe and healthy, so lead-free, um, no asbestos, those kinds of things, safe egress. Um, really important that it be energy efficient, and this is clearly one of those areas where our aspirations overlap with other committees. Um, we want it to be resilient in response to disaster. A lot of our housing is in the flood zone or in, um, um, and potentially in harm's way, so we need to think about that, both in terms of our existing housing and any new developments. And we want it to be designed for all users. We want it to be accessible. Um, and where is that housing going to be? It's going to be within different types of neighborhoods. Um, and those neighborhoods can be like the housing that's on Elm Street. It's really concentrated, really dense. Or it might be neighborhoods that are like those that are up off of Berlin Street, around Stonewall Meadows, or um, on the upper parts of um, Town Hill Road, where the lots are much bigger and that's much more spread out. Um, but the goal should be for those neighborhoods to be accessible to pedestrians, um, youth cyclists, um, strollers, wheelchairs, and we really um, would hope that they all could include a mix of uses, um, access to open space, um, and allow people um, without too much trouble to get to work, shopping, recreational, and community resources like the Senior Center, City Hall, and other things that they need um, to, to be active parts of the community. And then finally, it's really important that um, uh, the housing be available and open to everybody and that we create the most diverse and welcoming community that we can. Um, and the, so this includes protecting people from discrimination. Maybe it means trying to make our programs accessible and our city government accessible. Um, to people who don't have English as a first language. Um, in many of the affordable housing projects here in Montpelier, they've welcomed new citizens and different, um, created different communities um, over time, and we would hope that that continue to be the case. So, Polly, is there yeah. anything we want to sort of add to that? But those, those are kind of the yeah, highlights. Those are the highlights. And as Jen said, we're, we're going to be working on goals. but. We and are, we, and um, yeah, and we'll figure out how to interact with your process in doing that. And then at the same time, we're doing other pieces of work, too. Um, we can do and plan at the same time. But we're do, working on an update to the um, guidelines for the use of the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund. We're thinking about how to help the Good Samaritan Haven when they do the second year of the warming shelter. 
um, and we'll also be advocating for more funding for the Montpelier Housing Task Force um, because right now trust we're just sorry trust, trust fund. fund thank you yep. <laughs> we're just able to support the down payment assistance and there's not money available for rental housing at this point so happy to take questions yeah. Yeah. Like we welcome that. the invitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm Dan Dickerson from the Parks Commission. Fortunately, I don't have a slideshow for you. Usually, just use sticks and write in the dirt at our meetings. So, <laughs> you know, that stuff just doesn't have the staying power of, uh, of computers. But anyways, um, so I guess to lead off, we have a nifty little um, document called the Parks Green Print that's available on the Parks website in some void um, somewhere. If you, if you search hard enough, you might find it. I don't know for sure, but it is there. Um, so anyway, the goals that I have for you are taken directly from that green pen. Um, the first one is to provide park and trail access to all neighborhoods and residents of Montpelier. Um, and one, I think one action that sort of the Parks Commission indirectly took in um, trying to meet that goal was uh, there was a working group convened by the previous mayor that sort of sought to um, create connections between Montpelier neighborhoods, um, sort of like the, the trail system in, in Middlebury, if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, there's you know one trail that goes all the way around and sort of everybody is within, maybe not spitting distance, but um, reasonable distance from it. Um, and I think the group really made some good progress. It'd be great to see uh, the new mayor reconvene that um, and I was a member of that group but there were a few other members of the community that were there and and it was sort of a little think tank um, and we accomplished a few good things um, but we haven't met in a while but that's that's one area um, you know increasing trail access and, and park access that um, we have an interest in as the Parks Commission um, the second goal is to enhance outdoor recreational activities for residents of all ages um, one big step that we recently took to work towards that is um, we authorized the creation of new multi-use trails in North Branch Park um, that would allow for some mountain biking use um, other than the one trail that just goes straight uphill and never ends. Um, so this will hopefully be a great way to sort of bring some of the mountain bikers back to Montpelier that maybe go to Stowe currently or or Waitsfield currently, um, and also allow people, you know, like me that don't mountain bike, but you know, run or walk, um, or just look for wildlife to use some new trails and see new areas of North Branch Park. Um, and then our third and final goal is to protect and preserve existing and unique natural areas. Um, and one uh, one area that really takes up a lot of this category as far as, as our time and resources is trying to eradicate the, the invasives that just continually come back year after year. Um, it's just an ongoing battle and we actually, we have uh, volunteers come from other countries for blocks of time, not specifically to eradicate invasives, though I think that's what they end up doing a lot of, but, um, but they come and help us do that and we have volunteers from the community that do that, um, but that's that's a big part of this category is, um, you know, the best, well, one of the most important ways to um, preserve existing landscapes is to keep the, the crap that we don't want out. Um, so anyway, that's uh, my presentation. I, you know, as I've been sort of contemplating this, I think there is another goal that we can, that we can come up with, um, but uh, we'll have to discuss it as a Parks Commission, and we haven't really gotten that far yet but I think you know something that we've talked about is you know we really exist to help manage the parks 
we don't have a group that's really sort of advocating for the parks or you know really thinking of great new ideas for how the parks can you know bring in new funding or or you know new activities and so I think you know whether it's a goal for the parks commission or somebody else well, I think it's most important for us to to contemplate this is you know is there is there capacity for a group like that to exist? Are there people that are interested? You know, is there funding out there that we could bring in to sort of help this group coalesce and, and do great things for the parks? Because I think the parks are a really important part of, you know, the, the economic and, and social construct of, of any city. Um, but more, most importantly, Montpelier, because we have such great parks. But that's my presentation. Any questions? Yeah, I, have a, I have a question. The, does the Parks Commission discuss the, um, the position of our city within the broader region. I mean, I, I know that we're trying to be this center, economic and social center of the region, but we also want to preserve open spaces and parks and figuring out how to work both of those things together. I mean, I think that our positioning within the region may play a little bit of a role of how much we want to advocate for a large, uh, connected, open space versus I I th else. it's it's a discussion that we as the the parks commission don't so much have because we deal with very specific very acute issues at our meetings that are once a month and they're never long enough um, to get everything done that we want to but I will say that the the group that I was talking about this this working group that was convened by the mayor was thinking sort of outside of the community as far as you know, if we're if we're talking about building connections, I mean, there are these really great resources that exist. You know, just beyond our borders, or maybe a little ways away. You talk about Wrightsville. You talk about um, Morse Farm. Um, you know, if any of you read the Times Argus a few months ago about the possibility of the individual off Terra Street that just owns a huge chunk of land, mm -hmm. talking about creating a connection all the way to the the Worcester Range. I mean, that's incredible. So it's it's a discussion that's happened beyond the Parks Commission. Um, but I think going back to the need for, you know, some group that's thinking more strategically and big picture, um, I don't know that we have the capacity to, to do it, you know, the way, you know, given the, the other issues that we normally deal with. But I, I fully agree with you. It's, it's an incredibly important issue. And, and I love discussing it, um, but the time is limited to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie. Uh, again, Buzz Sir Willow with the Recreation Board. Um, our, our board meets monthly and uh, we take a summer vacation in August, so we haven't had a meeting since July. So we haven't talked face to face about what our goals would be in context of this meeting. We just had a flurry of emails over the weekend, and so I'm just going to have to ad lib what I heard from my fellow board members. Uh, and, and we, in theory, are a five-person board. We've been stuck at three for years, so it's a shameless plug if anybody wants to join our board or has friends or family, we can certainly use the help. Uh, and that being said, we are an advisory board to the rec department, so we tend to um, focus on the nuts and bolts of the operation of the department. You know, should the, should the rec department buy a new plow truck this year or milk it out for another year or how do we mediate conflicts between the pickleball players and the basketball players who want to use the court at the same time and so not exactly heady topics we get involved in so uh, you know long-term planning for us is is coming up with a budget for the next year that the city council will approve and the budget and the voters will approve uh, that all being said certainly our number one goal uh, the council knows this, previous councils know this, is to come to some resolution of what to do with the 55th Street Barry building. Uh, I don't know if I should be embarrassed or 
proud of my stick to itness, but uh, I was part of a Recreation Futures Committee, I think back in 1991, that grappled with this issue and actually came up with a report and recommendations and budgets uh, for a new building. Uh, so here we are 25 plus years later and we're still have that question out there. Um, so as we see it again, it's either keep the building as it is, you know, maintain it as it is, keep on plugging away the status quo, uh, put a lot of money into that building to upgrade it, make it accessible, make it, uh, you know, more user friendly, just bring it up to code. Uh, and then thirdly, do we sell that building and, and site some new facility? And that there's a whole range of options there. Where do we, where would we put it? Would it be Montpelier specific or regional? What would it encompass? How would we pay for it, of course? Uh, you know, would it be public or private or, or quasi-public? So a whole range of issues, all of which need input from the community. It's you know, nothing that we as a board uh, can ever come up with. We've tried to gauge people and, and do surveys, but it's been really difficult. So uh, you know, if that's our number one goal, then uh, number two, there are just a bunch of niggly little infrastructure problems and upgrades that are needed. Uh, if anybody's used the pool house, that's a pretty tired building. And, if you use the bathrooms, <laughs> it's not pleasant. You know, yeah, you know, right. If, if 55 Barry Street is up here in the pool house down here, it's a seasonal building. But of course, if we if we put enough money into it and upgrade it, it could be used for other things. It could be used year round, and so that's something we've considered. Uh, and then you know, sort of the overarching goal. Um, well, I'll just say kudos. I think our, our board would be unanimous in giving kudos to the city for assimilating the the parks and rec and senior and cemetery. We think that's been a great move and really has been, uh, you know, effective and efficient and, you know, programs I think have blossomed because of that. And uh, so, you know, continue that assimilation would be great. And again, our mission basically is to continue to provide recreation opportunities for all of Montpelier. And, you know, we have a changing demographic and changing tastes in recreation. We try to stay ahead of that curve and uh, that's what we want to continue to do so. That's it. Questions? So I'm Sarah Hoffmeyer again on the Montpelier Tree Board. And I wanted to start before I got into goals just saying that I've been on the board for about nine years. And um, what's so exciting is the last year to two years, we have had just this surge of energy. And Lynn is also on the board. And just the people that we have on the board right now and the regular volunteers, um, lots of different pet projects going on. And um, the biggest thing is follow through, which is always a wonderful surprise um, because it's <laughs> so easy to come up with ideas and be like, yes, and then you leave the meeting and you know, it's like thing, life happens. But um, we've had a lot of follow through, so it's been great. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out before I got to goals was um, uh, all the housing and energy um, wanted to relate it to tree board a little bit, uh, was John Snell, our chair, went out one day, and he used to have an infrared company, and he went out with an infrared camera on one of those blazing hot days when it was like 95 degrees, and he took an image right in front of Bear Pond Books of uh, the street, and the asphalt was 124 degrees, and under that ash tree that's in front of Bear Pond Books, it was 74. Mm -hmm. and so just to show how important it is to have mature street trees, um, which gets me into my goals. Um, <laughs> our aspirations, and this one was written by Lynn, that we all fully support. We hope to have, the tree board hopes to have a city of people literate about trees and their multi-layered value to the health, beauty, prosperity, and sustainability of Montpelier and central Vermont. I think anyone can kind of get behind that. 
Um, whenever John Snell brought up goals, uh, of course, our overachieving board just sent him this slew of a hundred different ideas and what we're going to maintain, evolve, and transform. Um, so we have three main goals, and then I'll just touch on a few of them because it would take me an hour to get through everything. Um, our first goal is to increase the size and diversity of the urban tree canopy. Um, this is particularly important right now uh, with the, the thing that's gotten the most attention is the emerald ash borer but there are a number of pests that have come through. And as long as you have different types of trees and all different ages of trees, you will have a more resilient landscape. Um, things that we're doing uh, to maintain that are we work closely with um, parks and public works. And we, I think, would be a fish out of water if we did not have Jeff Beyer and Alec Ellsworth who support us in not just our pet projects, but really get to the trees that we point out to them that are hazardous, that need to be pruned, that we can't do, that we need somebody that has the equipment, um, big plantings. Uh, they also have the resources with volunteers, like you were saying, that with the parks that come from, the AmeriCorps volunteers, uh, volunteers and then other volunteers that come from different countries, and I just can't imagine what we would do without them. We get a lot done. Uh, our second goal is to educate citizens about the value of trees as well as their care. Um, Lynn actually started uh, neighborhood plantings a couple of years ago on St. Paul Street and we've continued that effort every year. It's really easy to put a tree in the ground, but I think it's a lot more difficult to properly plant the tree and then also maintain it so that it's successful way down the line. And it's those first couple of years that to plant it correctly and then prune it the right way, water it, and it takes education. And we hope too to educate people about the tree board. I think I just saw a front porch forum post saying, is there a tree board? I'm like, yes, there is, we're here. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get the word out that um, we exist. And then our third goal is improve the health of our urban forest. And that kind of goes back with um, the first and second goals. Uh, and we're gonna continue to do that just with monitoring, um, the spread of diseases and making sure that we're working as a group to um, research and address them. Because luckily, unfortunately, they've hit usually states before us. So Massachusetts, New York. And so we can learn from actually the other states and what's worked and hasn't before it hits us. Does anyone have any questions? definition of the urban forest is. It's not street trees that you were referencing before. That's true. Our, our urban forest, we kind of view as everything within the city limits of Montpelier. Um, but in particular, we kind of have these little classifications of our urban forest. So the downtown is one section, and then we go out to kind of neighborhoods, and then we do consider parks part of our urban forest. So we have kind of those three areas. But that's all of, anything that has a canopy, I feel like falls under our urban forest. And even small trees. So not just like the big majestic oaks, but those little service berries, that they're a, a really important part of adding to the health of the ecosystem in total. Yeah. The urban, urban forest in Vermont State House is the only state house in the country that has a backdrop of a forest. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Yeah. Glad I live here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Development Review Board and then Historic Preservation Commission slash Design Review Board. All right, um, my name is Kate McCarthy and I've been the Vice Chair of the Montpelier Development Review Board for one week and about 33 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a new role. Um, I want to make sure you know a little about the Development Review Board. It may, its function may, not, may or may not be familiar to everybody. So um, the Planning Commission, as you know, um, looks at the future of the city with help from the residents. And another function the Planning Commission has is to create the zoning. So in a way, they're like legislators. They create rules. The Development Review Board, in a way, is like a judiciary where we look at those rules and apply them to cases um, or where you know, quasi-judicial is, is a way of looking at it. So um, we're a little bit different, the DRB, than a lot of the folks in this room and the committees that you serve on, which are more issue or topic based. We are a review body. So um, I just want to 
let you know that we may have a slightly different view and engagement in this process. Um, the other thing I want you to know about the DRB is we're a seven member board and as of last Monday's meeting we welcomed four new members. And so it's an exciting time. We have new zoning in the city. We have a relatively new board with people um, learning that zoning. Um, so as a result, that, that actually brings me to my disclaimer, which is that we have not as a board <laughs> brainstormed and identified three concise handy goals for me to hand you this evening. Um, but I did consult with our chair, Dan Richardson, and we brainstormed some things that we thought um, we can pretty safely bring to your attention, even if we are not per se representing the view of the DRB. So, so I'll, I'll tell you what those are. There are three of them, so in that sense, I've followed the rules. But um, <laughs> the first idea is, um, the first thing I bring to your attention is just an overarching value, um, which is to provide consistent, fair, and timely review of applications in a way that serves the applicants, people who want to build the project, but anyone else who is interested, and that might be neighbors or business owners or uh, just other interested citizens. Uh, this may seem pretty obvious, like isn't that the job of the DRB? Um, but I think if we're talking about ultimately achieving our land use goals, about what we want to happen where and how, um, and our city's goals for good governance, it's pretty, it's, it's very, very much worth stating that overarching value. Um, I would mention a couple of needs that we see as not, you know, things to do tomorrow, but kind of ongoing conversations and things that are important to uh, discuss and, and keep in mind. And one, as, as people, as the group who administers the bylaw, there's always that art and balance of having flexible but clear <laughs> standards so that when someone is applying to do a project, they know what is expected of them. And when we are reviewing a project, we know whether that project meets the criteria or not. At the same time, being too black and white can be a challenge and not leave room for the types of projects or innovations that we want to see. So, um, you know, we'll keep walking that line and hope to do that in conversation with, with the Planning Commission as we get used to the new zoning. Another thing that I've been asked to mention um, is to sort of like, let's just continue to look at how parking works under the new zoning and to make sure that any changes are um, data driven. Um, and I'll explain that. Um, we think, it, uh, I, I'm going to speak for myself now, I think it's very positive that parking requirements have been eliminated from the new zoning. Um, it's, it's positive change, it's a good practice, it's a best practice for sustainability. Um, now speaking for the DRB, um, as we administer the zoning, I think we'll need, it will be our responsibility as a board to keep an eye on how that works and whether it's leading to any unintended consequences, you know, are people going to pave over their lawns so that they can provide a spot off the street, we don't want that to happen. Um, so we just want to keep an eye on that. I'm not suggesting any changes right now. I am suggesting thoughtfulness. Um, since we know parking provides community benefits and challenges, um, we would just advocate that, I would, I would say the DRB advocates for the, any changes to parking being made in a way that is very much um, comprehensive based on studies of the big picture so as to provide a realistic view of how much parking we do in fact have before we go making big changes. Thank you. Um, and then with dedication to our future sustainability goals. Um, and when I say data driven, I think that means, you know, big picture look, not just anic data, um, not just the needs of any one individual group. It's gotta be big picture, community oriented. So I'll close with just kind of a general statement or desire from the DRB. It may fall outside of the town plan, but um, I wanna highlight that we have a lot of interest in building connections with the planning commission. Um, this is an excellent start and, I, and I'm meeting a lot of other groups as well. I know many of you as individuals, but not as, as, as your other functions. So, um, you know, of course, the nature of our respective commissions is that the DRB has this quasi-judicial role, whereas the Planning Commission has more of a legislative one. Um, so we're not suggesting that we bring the P Planning Commission in to review applications with us. We have a separation of powers thing here. Um, but I do think there is a lot to be gained uh, for each body understanding where the other comes from. And so uh, with the new zoning and a new board, we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll invite Eric. Wow, can you do that? Wow. <laughs> Eric, you can come on up and present on behalf of the Historic Preservation Commission and the Design Review Committee, and then. After he stands, do we have anyone else who didn't RTP that joined us on a whim tonight? <laughs> 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 okay. 
All right, I didn't think so, but just in case. Um, after Eric, we'll just take a look at the goals that were provided to us by the Complete Streets Group, and then we'll be down with the presentation portion. All right, Eric. Hi. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and thank the Planning Commission for doing this. I've been working on trying to integrate these things for a while. Uh, I think one of the points that I want to make is historic preservation and historic resources in Montpelier are really key to the city, uh, its activity, its economic health, uh, and the goal really of the uh, Historic Preservation Commission is to be an advocate. And uh, I go back to the root of that word, uh, to speak for, uh, to look at that. And that's what we're looking. We were defunct for a couple of years and we're back going and in the process of uh, uh, drafting some new guidelines for design review because I would say the vast majority of uh, the design review applications deal with an historic building because the uh, design review district at this point is concurrent with the National Register District, which the commission just worked hard and got updated. So it was first done in 1977, and now it's updated with uh, current in inventory. And uh, the 86% uh, of the buildings in the district are historic, uh, which is very high. and. I can tell you from talking to people around the country, I used to be active in National Historic Preservation stuff, uh, that uh, people are very envious of what Montpelier has in the way of historic resources. Uh, our intact downtown, our walkable downtown and neighborhoods. Uh, I brought a bunch of people here for a meeting and I said, don't bring your car, you don't need one in Montpelier. And some of them didn't believe me and they let their car sit for three days. They didn't need it, which it goes with the Transportation Committee at being an advocate for, uh, for uh, transportation. Uh, the other thing, I'll do the goals last. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I'd like to, like to uh, do with, uh, and this isn't an official goal, but is the idea of working with some of the other committees. I think, uh, if you look at the Energy Committee, it doesn't seem like, well, maybe that doesn't have much to do with historic pr preservation. But if one thinks about the embodied energy in historic buildings, if you tear them down, you're using energy, you're filling up the landfill, and you're using a lot of energy to build a new building. Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the development uh, corporation, uh, I always, uh, when I worked for the state, Everybody said, why is historic preservation in a development agency? And it, because we're responsible for the development of Vermont's historic resources one way or another. And I think that same thing is true here. I mean, the development of the Abishans building, I forget the name of the building. <laughs> but, uh -huh. French block. The French block. Um, that's been sitting vacant and people have been tackling that. But that's a good example of how uh, and historic project can not only get funding through the tax credits and things by uh, 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 because it's historic, but it meets housing goals, it meets energy goals, it meets a lot of goals in the community, housing downtown and all of that. Uh, I would like to work with uh, Montpelier Alive uh, to uh, help and promote the historic downtown and the historic resources in Montpelier. Uh, so, and uh, the design review committee, and as I said in the beginning, and the uh, uh, historic preservation commission uh, are really work a lot together. So, okay, uh, one minute sign here. Uh, <laughs> we want to, uh, one of our goals, we just, we just have finished uh, developing a very rough draft with some new regulations and we want to finish that process uh, and uh, then really provide some public information so that people can understand the resources, have some guidance when they're doing a project is the, the right way to do it to meet the design review standards and the historic preservation standards. 
The other thing is that Montpelier is very historic. The National Register District only covers a small part of it. And there are many historic neighborhoods, uh, the Meadow, College Street, and we want to develop a plan for survey and adding to the National Register over the years. Because Montpelier is a certified local government, uh, so we can get some funding uh, from the state to help with that. And uh, uh, the other thing we want to do is advocate uh, for incentives for owner-occupied historic buildings because they, uh, the National Trust has identified those as the most underserved. So I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Complete Streets group. Uh, unfortunately, nobody was able to attend from their group. There was a family emergency for the representative who was planning to come. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of overlap. I think we've talked about all three of these already. <laughs> so uh, you can write them down, Barb, if you want, but uh, they're going to be duplicative. I just make sure they're represented. No, that's good. That's good. Can someone explain the difference between the transportation infrastructure group, the complete streets group, and the bicycle group? It seems like there's a lot of overlap. And why are they three separate things? They're not three, they're two. There's a bike group. There's not. Well, there's a mountain bike. What I heard there's, was isn't there, a there was trans infrastructure and then, and then education to. Donna, can you walk us through the committees? <laughs> Other people can add. Uh, there was a pedestrian, a bicyclist. We had parking. Parking. There we go. Parking. That meant a lot, and energy came in. But over time, we got to the place where we really needed to focus on infrastructure and education and outreach, and people were not interested in both. So we form two groups, and this group calls themselves the Complete Streets after the study we were doing at the time, dealing primarily with pedestrian, but more with education and outreach, whether it's pedestrian or bicycle or transit. And this group would love every group that overlaps with them to join their public events. That's when I really would like to see a lot more energy of us getting together and making public events that one group is planning to fit another need for another group. And so that would be really important. And uh, the infrastructure is dealing with how do we put a sidewalk in here that really accommodates? How do we uh, get flashing signals that make crossings more safe? They're really dealing with more the mortal, uh, okay, I just concrete. Didn't this was the same as the outreach. Yep. No, 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 it's a good question. But it's, is that clearer? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. that's recent, that this change is fairly uh, recent, yes. right? Two years? Yeah. yeah. Relatively. I yeah. think it was like four committees previously. So thank you. I had that question too, Kate. <laughs> okay, John Adams. So John John had some good ideas about how we can work together and continue the collaborative process um, from the convenience of our computers or devices. So I asked him to just give a few comments about that. Um, we're running low on time, so you'll be succinct be as you always are. And then we'll just wrap up. Great, thank you. Um, I'll be quick. Uh, I think I know most people in this room, but for those who don't know me, uh, I'm the nerdiest member of uh, your planning commission. <laughs> Therefore, they've tasked me with uh, setting up our, uh, a website for this plan which will be our goal is to have it be uh, more accessible to reach maybe new audiences with the plan and not only to communicate the plan but afterwards we want this to be a place where we can continue to use to track progress uh, to collect a lot of these resources these documents so that they can live on and that we don't lose them um, we also want to use this uh, throughout the process as a place where people can go to find out what's happening to provide input um, and to 
uh, for our committees to um, participate uh, as well. And it's not only the website, so we, the content for it will be housed in a, a Google Drive that we've set up. We have a, a Google Drive folder. And um, we'd like to make some for all the different committees and populate them, pre-populate them with templates uh, that provide some guidance on the best way to uh, provide us with input for the plan. Uh, if you have no idea what Google Drive is or don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. It's, uh, it, it's fairly simple and hopefully someone on your committee does, but otherwise we're happy to, to help you out. Um, but the goal is also to break down some of those silos between a lot of these committees so that, um, yes, you may, your committee may have you know, the only access to putting things in it, but it'll be transparent. Anyone from any other committee or the public can go in and see what uh, different committees are working on uh, within this one folder for our, our city plan. Uh, and I'll stop there, but uh, happy to answer any questions. information will go out to each committee once they're all set up in terms of how to, how to access it? Yes. yes. Yep. What, what are you looking for from our committees for each other? Just kind of continue to update you on what we're doing? Uh, so two things, I think, uh, specifically. One, this is a repository for uh, a lot of these these plans that have been done in the past, like we don't want to reinvent the wheel, and this could be one place where everyone can put these in. And then uh, second, there'll be a, a, a very specific template with, in terms of uh, how the plan will be structured, you know, with our goals, our objectives, our measurable objectives, our actions, what information we need from those, how, um, how they should be sort of, uh, what to include and what not to include. And if, if everyone can fill those out, in a consistent way, then we can uh, bring them together in a, a more cohesive plan. At least that's the goal for now. Mm -hmm. um, so my understanding is that there are certain chapters like housing, transportation, energy. What, what happens to the chapters where there are multiple committees involved? I can just anticipate, I mean, from the presentation tonight, I'm anticipating there are some chapters that um, it's not just one kind of point of contact. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's exactly what we're hoping to identify tonight. So we'll, we'll reconvene as a commission, identify where those uh, overlaps occur, and strategize a way to facilitate further collaboration. It doesn't sound like an insurmountable problem, but yeah. I'm not going to try to make something up here. So. I think there's going to be multiple stakeholders for all of the chapters, really. Yeah. Just, just yeah. because of the housing task force and that's like neatly, um, doesn't mean there's not going to be a lot of you know, input from everywhere anyway. So it'll probably be the same for every chapter where there's more input from many, many places. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about whether we want to have folders that are based on chapter with various committees with access to that, or if we want to have folders based on committee and then try to re redesign that. So I think we just need to have a little bit more of a conversation as a commission now that we know more about the goals that the committees have. And we'll get back to you. <laughs> but for now, I don't think there's any immediate need to put in any information here. Um, as we develop this, website we will call on you to if you want to if you had slides or notes for tonight that you want to upload there we can do that and then the public will be able to have easy access to that information um, we will also be posting videos um, and links to other city plans the, the videos are uh, Ed McMahon has given some talks recently gave a talk here recently for those who weren't able to attend we have access to a there's links to a TED talk that he provided. We could we could do, um, and it could also be a place where we could perhaps link to the Orca Media YouTube videos of tonight's meeting or the Egg McMahon presentation. So we're thinking of it as a resource for just everybody can contribute to it, and the public can easily see what's going on as we're working through the process. Is uh, this meeting going to be posted on Orca? Yes. Yeah, I would assume so. Um, I think that would be worth sending out to the committee members at some point for those that couldn't be here, they would be interested in it. 
Sure. Yeah, I could ask Jamie Granfield to just yeah. send a link out to everybody on the list that we yeah. sent the invitation to. Um, but that that was my that was my summary and wrap up. And <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think we're you know if we have any other questions about process, I mean, if you have any ideas about process, we would love to hear them. So, yeah, ideas mm -hmm. or want to help out with this. I don't want to give you the false impression that this is a, a, a fully baked, uh, <laughs> which I think I've done successfully. So. Yeah, so that's, yeah. And I don't think we have any members of the public that are here to talk about something not on the agenda for tonight, but I will ask now, because we have that on our agenda, is item eight. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Planning Commission, we are so grateful. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Great. Well, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Stephanie, do I have a second from Kim? Okay, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.